Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, three. City, city, sibilance, sibilance. Levels check, good, sounds good. One, two, three, rolling and... The only way, frankly, that you can make any kind of living is the budgets for these docs. Nobody's handing over $10 million for you to make a documentary. So, you know, you, you really do have to figure out whatever budget that you have, you have to figure out how to make it stretch and make it work for you and then ultimately start building off of that. And, and we have supplemented here and there with some corporate work and commercials and things like that. But really, it's just trying to, you know, keep a lot of plates spinning. Just stick with it and, and eventually, you know, you'll be OK. I think the, the hardest thing to do is to not give up. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 107, and it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, the Documentary Life podcast, and now the Independent Filmmaker's Essential Checklist course, our free eight-part course designed to help you achieve financial stability, gain support, and effectively distribute your documentary film. If you've ever ridden an elephant for any significant length of time, then you don't need me to tell you how quickly the romanticism of such an act, it wears out after about, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes of this slow, constant motion forward to the left, backward to the right, forward to the left, backward to the right. That same creaking sound for each movement as your body presses against the confines of a bamboo basket that's holding you in. There is no amount of padding, blankets, sleeping bag, backpack that ever truly buffers you from that bamboo eventually chafing your skin and bruising your body. And certainly not when you're stuffed in the basket with another human being. <laughs> I've been riding in this bamboo basket with my friend and our fixer translator, Kaizika, for the past four hours. We still have nearly six more hours to go before we break camp for the night. My back is achy and stiff, and my left leg is sore and chafed from the constant rubbing against part of the basket. But before I get too far into the pain and feeling sorry for myself, I take in our surroundings in the moment. I am about 10 feet above the ground, on top of a beautiful pachyoderm, trampling through a bamboo forest deep in the northeastern corner of Cambodia, about 10 kilometers from the border with Vietnam. I am sat next to Kaizika, a Cambodian gentleman whom I've known for the past five months since I first arrived to this country, and he was hired to work as one of our main fixer translators. I've come to know this man who is only a couple of years my junior, rather well in a relatively short span of time. There has been a bond formed between the two of us that is unlike most any bond I've shared with too many other people. Which makes sense, of course. I mean, this guy had taken us around some of the more remote provinces in this country and in some of the seediest cowboy towns imaginable. He has guided us to and through some of the most heavily mined areas in the world. He has been my roommate for any of the excursions outside of Phnom Penh where he lives with his young family. We've shared beers, taken in football matches, eaten fried tarantulas and fish head soups. 
I've been in a minor motorbike accident with him. I've zoomed inches from a King Cobra in another moto incident. Been in confrontations with Cambodian government officials. Swam half naked in dirty sections of the Mekong River with this man. So yeah, it makes complete sense why I might feel a particular sort of bond for this Cambodian man whom I was now traveling through the jungle with on top of a massive elephant. I pull out a small pack of very warm chewing gum from my pocket, hoping to keep my mind from the pain that builds up just a little more with each and every movement and scrape of the basket against my back and legs. I unravel a stick and offer one up to Kaizuka, which he gladly accepts. I then tap the shoulder of the mahout, the elephant driver, and hold the pack out to him. He speaks zero English, and in fact, I may be one of a handful of white people he's ever seen in his life and my rudimentary Khmer isn't working either. In fact, he doesn't speak a ton of Khmer either, since he's from one of the hundreds of ethnic minorities that live out in this part of Southeast Asia. He speaks just enough so he and Kaizuka can communicate. I'm still holding the pack out to him when he turns to Kaizuka. Kaizuka lets out a surprise, then notifies me that this man doesn't know what chewing gum is. He's never seen it in his life. I am amazed and I love this. And I'm reminded of just how far from home I am. After a bit of convincing from Kaizuka, he hesitantly takes a stick from the pack, unwraps the wrapper, and sticks the piece in his mouth. He chews it for a bit. Kaizuka explains to him not to consume, but to simply chew. Then after a couple of minutes, he spits the gum to the earth below, kind of shakes his head in disgust, pulls out a cigarette, and lights it up. He smiles contentedly again. Almost in response, the elephant squeals out and begins to tear a small tree from its roots and proceeds to consume the whole thing in 30 seconds. Then the elephant starts to take on a small hill that is in front of us. Our backs are thrown against the back of the bamboo basket. I swallow my gum as I let out a small cry in pain, to which the driver quickly looks back at me, frowning. ha, I say to him, no problem. He doesn't respond, only gently prods the elephant upwards. The next day at about 5.30 in the morning, I would take a very hero-esque photograph of Kaizuka. He's in the foreground while two of the elephants are walking in the river in the background. That photograph would win me a minor photography award the next year. To this day, it's still one of my favorite photos I've ever snapped. And certainly, it's the finest one of Kaizuka I have. Fifteen years later, he's still using this as his Facebook profile pic. Somehow, that to me is more satisfying than the photography award. It's late February, and we're set to begin one of the final bits of filming that I'll be doing on this trip. We're in a small village in the province of Kampong Tom a province that Kaizuka and I know quite well, having spent much time filming here over the years, whether it was spending eight days filming villagers digging up a 200-kilogram bomb from the soil during the filming of Bomb Hunters, or shooting a TV commercial for a hotel and lake resort, or when we had last been here five years ago filming on Elvis. We'd spent much time in this part of Cambodia, a place that was as flat as a pancake, was peppered with many coconut and palm trees, and had once been a major concentration for the Khmer Rouge. Which was what had brought us here five years ago, and again today, to film with one of our main subjects. A gentleman by the name of Kyle Sinan. Sinan was a former musician turned farmer for the Khmer Rouge. I won't dare share some of the critical and amazing parts of his story here. That's strictly for when the film comes out. But you'll just have to take my word for it when I say to you that without this man and his story, our film would be much less interesting and wouldn't tie into two other major figures in our film's story. His story is remarkable, and saying that it was important to our film, well, that would be a vast understatement. thing is, he was a little bit of a tricky character. 
First off, he was not necessarily easy to get a hold of. He had spent decades making himself hard to find. Again, I'm not going to reveal details here. Secondly, as it turns out, he was a pretty shrewd businessman. So even when we pleaded to him five years ago, and his close friend pleaded to him on our behalf, he was very, very hesitant to let us film with him. And it was going to cost us a little dough. Which, by the way, is not something I tend to get wrapped up in. Paying any of our subjects any kind of money. I've just never wanted to go down that shady road with any of my doc subjects. Not that I have any extra budget to be playing around with to begin with, but he was one of two people that I've ever filmed that insisted that he be paid something for his time. And so, whenever I'm up against this sort of thing, I turn to my most trusted fixer translator friend, Kaizuka. And like I said, kaizuka has been doing this long enough that he understands the situation. He gets why it might be a strange sort of thing for a doc film to offer up cash to someone. And he also knows that doc films by nature don't have much in the way of a budget. But try explaining this to someone from a Cambodian province who lives in a wooden house on stilts and who supplies he and his family with food from the minimal vegetable patch and few chickens that he has roaming around his yard. Try explaining this to this person as you're holding a $16,000 camera on your shoulder, wearing fancy-looking sunglasses and impressive-looking hiking boots. So this is the sort of moment where I rely on a Kaizuka to weave his magic or use his mojo, if you will, which he had done in his usual graceful way and had managed to talk Mr. Kayo down to about $75 for the day. On top of that, he made sure to let Mr. Kayo know that the $75 was not payment for his being in our documentary film, which was certainly not a Hollywood film with a Hollywood budget, that in fact, that money was a kind donation from director Chris for Kayo Sinan and his family to build a more substantive vegetable patch. Patrick and I arrived to Kampong Tom ahead of Kaizuka, and we decided to go out and scout the next day's location, which I decided for fun to try and do by memory of having been here five years prior, and to see if we couldn't find Kaio Sinan on our own, which by the way, is the very sort of fun kind of exercise one can try and do in a Cambodia, or at least that I would try and do. Simply go out and try and find someone in a town using a limited knowledge of the language relying on the goodwill of the Khmer people to want to help two white dudes, or barangs, who were simply roaming around with a camera. Eventually, after about an hour or two of walking down paths and chatting with villagers, we stopped at a house to film someone who was making traditional instruments by hand. We were doing this filming for about 20 minutes, when suddenly I spotted a very recognizable man making his way down the road towards us. It was Kayo Sinan. We had no idea how he'd known we were here, but I think we can safely assume that word had gotten around about the Barang who were in town with cameras and asking about him. When we saw one another, we waved, and as he got closer, I thought we might have more of an exchange. But surprisingly, he walked right on past me. He pulled up a chair and he sat down next to one of the men I'd been filming. For the next hour before sundown, Patrick and I filmed the men building the instruments, all the while trying to interact with Sinan, in hopes of getting some footage of him with the artisans. But he seemed to want no part of it. It all felt very strange and unexpected, a fairly sizable letdown, to be totally honest. So, when we went back to our guest house and met up with Kaizuka at the end of the day, we explained to him what we'd experienced. He listened attentively, showed mild surprise, then did what Kaizuka always does. He picked up the phone and made a call, this time directly to Kayo Sinan, and he arranged for us to meet up with him for dinner in an hour's time. <laughs> Three hours later, in a small river shack made of reeds, overlooking a stagnant, smelly, littered pond, and after some bowls of hot pot and a few Angkor beers, Patrick and I watched as Kaizuka and the previously unhappy-looking Kaio Sinan were roaring with laughter over yet another story that one of them had told one another. 
Sometimes I had a sneaking suspicion, maybe at our expense. As the evening progressed, Sinan kept refilling our glasses and cooking our noodles and smiling away at us. In some ways, it was all baffling. This was literally the exact opposite reaction to how we'd been received earlier by him in the village. In other ways, not so baffling. For one, who did we think we were just rolling into the village with our cameras ablazing, asking around for Kyosinon, and then basically trying to film him without his permission? Secondly, and maybe more importantly, this was how my good friend Kaizuka operated. What he flourished in. Why I tried to hire him on every shoot I ever do in Cambodia. He has a way with people. And it wasn't simply because he was Cambodian and I was not. I'd worked with other Fixer translators here, and no one ever got the type of response that this guy did wherever we went. Whether a quiet, dusty provincial town, a bustling, sketchy border town, or the capital city, wherever Kaizuka went, he had a way of opening people's hearts. I'd witnessed his pure, delightful magic for many years. The way he would meet someone for the first time, and within minutes, was chatting away like they'd known one another for years. All the while, he was greasing the wheels in a way that always allowed us to get whatever we needed for our film. And so it was, on this evening, that I raised my glass to Patrick, nodded over in Kaizuka's direction. I smiled, and I made a toast to our dear friend Kaizuka. A silent recognition to the fixers and translators of the world. For without them, we would merely be foreigners fumbling around with our expensive film equipment, lost souls in a foreign land, oblivious to the subtleties of the world around us, that we were so desperate to capture on camera. Thank you for listening to episode 7 of our Chris in Cambodia series. To check out some great behind-the-scenes footage of our time in Kampong Tom, including some pretty exciting photos and video of yours truly filming Kaio Sinan banging on the drums in the middle of a dusty provincial Cambodian road, or the aforementioned prize-winning photograph of Mr. Pon Kaizuka, head over to the show notes for today's episode by going to our website at thedocumentarylife.com. Something I wanted to mention before continuing on with today's show. You've probably noticed that we're playing around with some pretty cool fresh sounds on this season of TDL. And I'd like to thank Music Vine for supplying us with those cool fresh sounds. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about how Music Vine might be able to serve your doc project, you can check out the show notes for today's episode, or you can simply go to their website at musicvine.com. I wanted to jump back on here and have a quick word with you. I'm sure regular listeners of the podcast have noticed that the show recently went from weekly to bi-weekly, and I wanted to give you a brief explanation of why this is. Producing an episode of the Documentary Life podcast takes a lot of time, thought, and energy. And even though we love doing it, it was starting to feel like it was infringing upon our ability to be working on our own documentary film. And obviously, that just didn't sit right with us. So we had a choice. Reduce the content on each weekly episode, or maintain and even improve the episodes we produce, but put them out less frequently. To us, this was a no-brainer. We never want the quality of this podcast to go down. In fact, we want it to get better and better. And by allowing us more time to work on our own doc film, and allowing the reality of our filmmaking experience to filter in, we believe that will be the case. We want to say a big thank you to those of you who enjoy, support, and find inspiration in this podcast. You are the reason that we make it, Doc Lifer. If you're anything like me, when it comes to doc film preparations, checklists are an essential part of that preparation. Whether it's putting together a gear list, storyline notes for an edit, or gathering materials for a grant application, checklists are very helpful in ensuring that we're prepared for whatever may lie ahead in our doc journeys. Which is why Steph and I have put together a very special offering for you. A free 8-chapter course we're calling the Independent Doc Filmmaker's Essential Checklist. 
In it, we outline the essential areas you need to build or establish the non-creative, or as we prefer to refer to them, business aspects of your documentary film. We believe that given the right strategy and insight, every doc filmmaker can achieve their goals and intentions with their films, that there is money out there for every project, and that every film can be met by an active, eagerly anticipating audience, and that includes yours. This course will take you closer to that outcome. To enroll in the Independent Doc Filmmakers Essential Checklist course, just head on over to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. It's free, and just as we do here on the show, this eight-chapter checklist course will inspire and inform you on your documentary film journey. Documentarians Don Argot and Sheena M. Joyce have made films on subjects as diverse as rock bands and nuclear power, the legal theft of priceless art collections, and who really created Batman. Having also directed a narrative feature, the team brings a unique and critical perspective to the meta elements at work in creating film scenes that function as a compelling running commentary on the DeLorean story. 914 Pictures is an independent film production company specializing in documentary feature films. Co-owned by Don Argett and Sheena Joyce, their filmography includes Rock School, Two Days in April, The Art of the Steel, Last Days Here, The Atomic States of America, As the Palaces Burn, Slow Learners, Batman and Bill, and Believer. Their upcoming 10th film is Framing John DeLorean, a documentary-slash-narrative hybrid on auto maverick John Z. DeLorean. Starring Alec Baldwin in the title role, the film explores the complex life of DeLorean from father of the American muscle car to builder of the futuristic sports car bearing his name. It is being released worldwide by IFC Films and Universal Pictures. Don and Sheena, welcome to the Documentary Life podcast. We're happy to have you on the program today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So first and foremost, what I'd love to hear about is how the two of you first started working together in documentary. Sure. Um, Well, I I had a production company with a previous business partner, uh, which we started right out of film school. Uh, I went to the Art Institute of Philadelphia and uh, graduated in 1995. And we opened a production company with really the sole reason uh, to make films. And... Then, you know, kind of the real world reality of uh, life crept in and we realized that making films was inspiring and awesome, but we needed to make money. (laughs) So we really set out and and, and kind of dug a path for ourselves doing a lot of commercials and corporate work and, you know, kind of long form Mm -hmm. infomercials, things like that. All while, you know, it was great to be working and making money. Uh, We were getting further and further away from, you know, the whole reason that we we put the business together, which was to make movies. And uh, we ended up uh, parting ways in, I believe it was 2002. Um, And Sheena and I, who are also a couple, uh, Sheena worked at the Philadelphia Film Office, which is basically like uh, acts as a free producer for the city for visiting uh, productions. Mm. And we had known each other for um, about three and a half years and uh, started to spend a lot more time together and we uh, started to date. And then at this time was when uh, my my situation with my previous partner was dissolving. Mm. And I was really just looking for the real kind of, I guess, inspiration to kind of you know, kind of bring me back around to why I got into this thing in the first place. Mm. And Sheena was amazingly encouraging. uh, And I would come home like every day with uh, a new idea to make a documentary because (laughs) I loved making, I loved the idea of making docs. We had started a few short docs, uh, you know, previously. um, And I really loved the idea of working very small and being able to kind of pick up a camera and go. And, you know, my background is in, cinematography and I also edit and so it was very easy for me to just you know the idea of making a documentary didn't seem or feel daunting at all it seemed very manageable 
And I was walking down the street one day in Philadelphia, and there were these wheat posted wheat pasted posters up on the walls uh, about the Paul Green School of Rock Music, and they were very <laughs> colorful. Uh, they were very eye catching, and they just kind of spoke to me at a time that I was just really, really in need of you know inspiration. And I said to myself, that's that would probably make a great documentary, yeah. not knowing anything about anything, yeah, never yeah. seeing the school or anything like that. So uh, this was in 2002. It was kind of early Internet days. Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of information online. Mm-hmm. So I called Paul up, and he was a few blocks away from where my office was and told him I was a filmmaker that was interested in making a documentary about him. And he said, okay, cool. And uh, <laughs> I showed up on a Monday, and I started rolling on Friday. And uh, Sheena eventually got involved in that project so much that she left her job. Yeah. And we decided to kind of like, you know, join forces and we made this film together. And that's where we met our longtime editor, Demi and Fenton. So the whole kind of like Avengers team assembled <laughs> under this one idea of, hey, let's just do a documentary. And uh, we did it and it came out and, and we premiered at the L.A. Film Festival in 2004 and sold it. And that was really the beginning for us getting into this business. Amazing. Clearly, I did not do enough of my research. I did not know that you guys were a couple as well, which is great because my wife and I had met doing, she was doing features work over in the UK and then Southeast Asia, which is where we met, where I'd been filming a documentary. And so this is great to know that we're speaking filmmaking couple to filmmaking couple. Very exciting indeed. Yeah, right. Sheena, tell me about some of your beginnings with with, uh, with film and documentary. My first experience with documentary was really working in rock school with with Don. Yeah. I, you know, I was an English major in college yeah. and had worked in local um, film and television production, but yeah. but you know, it really didn't start until I started working for the Greater Philadelphia Film Office, which, as Don said, kind of it's the Philly Film Commission, so it kind of acts as like a free producer for visiting productions, right, and that's how right. I kind of how to produce. And as Don said, he was just, you know, trying to get his creative juices flowing again. And I was helping out at night and on weekends as much as I could and got involved enough to quit my job. And, you know, we started to to work together. Um, I guess fortunately or unfortunately, we sold our first film, which made us think we could make a living at this. Right. And uh, here we are. (laughs) And here we are. Exactly. Exactly. I'm curious. As you're making your doc films, how many films might you guys have in development at one time? The reason why I ask that is because I think one of the struggles that a lot of, uh, including myself and a lot of other doc filmmakers have is often we spend so much time on our doc film that by the time we get through the entire process, that at the end of it, suddenly we're left realizing, oh, shoot, I didn't start development on any of the next ones. And so there's this large gap between doc films. So, Sheena, maybe you can give me some idea of what kind of strategy you guys are putting in place to kind of continue moving forward with your doc films and so you don't have that lag time between films. Yeah, of course. And and that's a lesson that we learned the hard way early on where we would spend all our time, you know, making the one film. And then, like you said, you know, oh, shoot, what do we do now? We need another movie. <laughs> um, it really took a couple of years for us to kind of get enough projects rolling that we felt like we could have, you know, a couple things going at mm. once. I think. I think not being afraid to start something and stop when you know it doesn't work mm. um, has helped. You know, at this point, 10 years, 15 years, yeah, we're 15 years later because I think we, we officially incorporated in 2003, so mm. like 16 years later. Um, I think we have 12 projects in development right now. Wow, wow, wow. It really is just three of us. It's it's Don and me and Demi and our editor, and of course we pick up, you know, people um, as we go and have been really lucky to have some great assistant editors. But yeah. at the core, you know, that's it. And and we have supplemented here and there with some corporate work and commercials and things like that. Yeah. But really, it's just trying to, you know, keep a lot of plates spinning. You know, what what does that look like? You know, what can you recommend in terms of advice for a doc filmmaker, you know, who is mired in the midst of their of, of their documentary project? And maybe they're 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 past. Maybe they're they're deep into post-production. Right. And they're looking forward to you know, getting their film out into the world. What can be, they be doing during that time and or should they be doing it way before that time to kind of start anticipating what the next films might be? Can you share a little advice with us 
this in the best approaches to do that? Well, I, I will say, and, and I don't mean this in, in any like derogatory sense, but I think that a lot of times the, the mistakes that young filmmakers make, yeah. they have to be made a certain way and they have to be done a certain way in order for you to kind of learn <laughs> yeah. how to kind of Evolve. And I and I and I mean that in 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 the most positive way because yeah. as Sheena said, oh that's it took us three and a half maybe four by the time we were doing Art of the Steel was the first time that we had an, an additional film going on mm. simultaneously. And it was a last days here. It was a passion project, so it wasn't anything we were getting money for or paid for. Yeah. So you know we were the Art of the Steel was was being funded. You know we were working on that, but really what it comes down to, and I think this is the this is my my parting uh, you know, the, this is the the bit of wisdom that you have when you get a little older and you've made a few documentaries is you start to understand how to make documentaries, and I mean that in the sense that you know. The the mistake that young film young documentary filmmakers make is they shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and they don't <laughs> stop shooting right yeah. and I think once you learn how hey you don't have to shoot all the time you really can get a sense of where the story's going early on you pick your spots you figure out like hey I don't need to be like uh, you know this this project is not gonna gonna gobble me up for a year where I'm just gonna be like gone and filming this thing and that's the frankly the only way that you can have multiple projects going on is you know with with documentaries you're usually following you know depending on the story you're following real life and you're in your embedded in characters lives and you know the the you don't have to be filming every day to be making a documentary so once you and there's a lot of times you know uh, certainly in our experience but i, I would assume in, in most people's experiences making docs is there's lulls there's there's mo there's sometimes weeks sometimes months uh where there's nothing going on with the story and and so those are the moments where you can really start to look at like oh, okay i can be and should be developing something else because i'm still working on this thing and we know that like you know all of june is pretty much like nothing much is going on so we can kind of and maybe we have to pick up a few days here and there but ultimately i can get going on something else and that's and that comes from being able to do it, uh, being able to understand how to make docs efficiently yeah. um, and, and compactly because, you know, that's the only way, frankly, that you can make any kind of living is the budgets for these docs. You know, nobody's, nobody's handing over $10 million for you to make a documentary. So, <laughs> you know, you, you really do have to figure out whatever budget that you have, you have to figure out how to make it stretch and make it work for you and then ultimately start building off of that you know you have a project going on cool and then let's get another project going on and then all of a sudden you have two two and a half projects going on and stuff in development and you can start to you know you, you know you could start to actually make a living one thing i would add is you kind of have to find your tribe also mm. like i i if don were just the one man band i don't know that he could have all these projects going at the same time you mm. know i think the fact that it's me and Don and our editor Demian are this kind of core team and our roles bleed into each other and we can hand things off to each other mm. and one per we divide and conquer, so to speak, yeah. allows us to do that. So finding, you know, these trusted partners that you can collaborate with kind of allows you the freedom and the flexibility to have a few things going at once. Are you surprised that a feature film hasn't been made about your dad and his life? Yeah. He's got cocaine, hot chicks, sports cars, bombed out buildings, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, FBI agents, and hardcore drug dealers. Allow me to introduce the DeLorean motor car. A number of people have been wanting to do a movie of my life. I'm going to try to be DeLorean. John DeLorean was the leading man Hollywood producers dream of, and he was real. He was one of the maverick rogues of his day. What the hell is this? That's a GTO. You're out of your damn mind. He married the world's top supermodel. My dad was at the peak of everything, and then came the car. This is the DeLorean Motor Company. It's impossible to start up a car company. This is real innovation. And you've got the money for this? Oh, yeah. John didn't have the money. We were heading for insolvency. 
John DeLorean is in jail this morning. I just found out a few hours ago. I know nothing. Stability and sanity left the household when he got arrested. Let us turn our attention to your current project, Framing John DeLorean. Now, I understand that you guys initially had wanted to do a DeLorean documentary a number of years ago. Of course, there were also a number of failed attempts at you know, fictional narratives about him. What happened yeah. with your initial attempt to make the documentary? And then how were you able to be brought back around to it this time? So we had a film called The Art of the Steel in the Toronto Film Festival. I guess this was like 2009. Mm. This has been kind of a 10-year odyssey. And one of the, as you, as you said, there were these competing narrative projects going on. And one of those projects approached us about doing the documentary companion piece to the narrative, you know, biopic John DeLorean story. Yeah. So we started to get into the story then. And then all of those narrative films fell apart for one reason <laughs> or another. And we, we stayed in touch with, um, with the company XYZ and the, and the filmmakers there became friends of ours and producers. And we just kind of stayed in touch through the years and would poke at the project every now and then. And I guess it was about two and a half years ago, they came back to us and said, hey, what do you think about, you know, really making it go with this DeLorean documentary? Keep all the narrative stuff out of it. And then Don and I were having these conversations about, well, maybe, maybe the fact that there were these competing narrative films that all failed is a part of the documentary. Right. Maybe, you know, we kind of, we kind of, frame the story in the sense that what is it about this guy that's that's so compelling to Hollywood and why can't anyone kind of pull off the film and that's how, really how we entered into the documentary. So for me the first and most obvious question about the film and this is coming from a doc film filmmaker standpoint why choose to introduce these narrative elements to this film and it sounds like you're getting into a little bit of, of how you came to that but what was so attractive for you guys to start using narrative elements within the doc film as a storytelling device it was born out of i think you know doing docs for a number of years and and always kind of looking to challenge ourselves and, and not do the same thing kind of over and over again. And, and also really trying to, just like we do with any film is like, what's the best way to tell the story and what's the most effective way to tell the story. Mm. And we kind of latched on to this idea of the failed movie script ideas. We thought that was, we were, there was a great opportunity to really use reenactments in a way that, you know, people aren't, used to seeing uh, in, in a film like this, you know, reenactments have definitely, you know, made, uh, you know, have gotten a lot more elevated in the past couple of years yeah. with uh, a lot of the Netflix shows and, you know, and, and, you know, they're, they look great, you know, and, and they're, they're, they've come a long way from the, you know, each true Hollywood story, uh, you know, kind of like <laughs> really, really low budget, you know, approach. And so, you know, that being said, you know, we were also looking to push that a little bit forward as well. And it was really what the story, uh, it, it suited the story well. And ultimately, you know, because uh, we had a relationship with Alec Baldwin, you know, we really felt like if we were going to do these reenactments, they just can't be the kind of like, you know, out of focus you know, where you never see the actors or, or, mm. or go the other way, which is find people that really look like the characters yeah. that are great actors, but are not well known. And so we really felt like being able to have somebody like Alec even consider the project, you know, we wanted, we were saying that John's is larger than life, you know, made for the Hollywood screen, you, got, uh, you know, kind of guy. So who else? but to get somebody who is, you know, kind of a larger than life personality that is a name, you know, if that's how, if Hollywood was doing this, you know, that idea of being able to use somebody like Alec to play the role we thought was great, but then we felt like that would also be kind of limiting because we're using him so sparingly throughout these reenactments. So how else can we, you know, kind of use Alec and, and this, this idea in the film and ultimately, that led us to, why don't we film the making of us making the narrative yeah. uh, stuff? <laughs> and, and I think that really opened up the, the possibilities for, for, for the film at that point. And because Alec is so thoughtful, and we would have all these great conversations with him and leading up to the film and do, doing makeup tests and stuff like that, yeah. where it was like, 
there should be a camera here because this is amazing. You know, all the stuff he's talking about with John and he's getting into the role. And like, we just thought that was very interesting. So that just provided us with like three different kind of elements to meld together to try to piece together who this guy was. So I, I, I have to I have to admit the whole meta aspect to this film is something that I was very drawn to. Meta is something that I've been into for many years. Uh, it's something that um, I mean it, it it definitely adds a an interesting element to the storytelling. To put it lightly, what what is also very intriguing to me is is as you're you're talking about here is sort of the the usage of behind the scenes within the actual film. Let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Why do you think the behind the scenes, why is that effective as a storytelling device? We haven't seen a ton of that. What is it that that works so well? And also, I'm curious, did this kind of happen through the course of filming? Or did you really, or did you come to you uh, the idea of using BTS before you actually sh- started shooting with Alec? We came to the idea before we started you shooting okay. Alec. We okay. were playing with the idea of um, how do you, here's kind of what started it. We, all of these narrative projects were associated with different people in John's life. One, you know, was, was kind of attached with um, his son. One was with his daughter. One was with his widow. And there were all of these scripts that were very different. So who were these, how is it that there are so many people that, that feel they were very, very close to this man, yet they have very different, versions of who that man was Mm. and that started the conversation about well how do you really get to know a person and who was the real john delorean and the frames through which you view people um and that really those conversations you know i guess they became kind of meta but Mm. um we they were they were bringing out really interesting really interesting parts of John's personality or, mm. or different points in his story. Um, and the conversations, you know, behind the scenes were fascinating enough that we thought, well, we should really incorporate this idea of exploring the character and trying to get to know the man and shooting us asking these questions will perhaps get a level deeper into the character and maybe show the audience um, a facet of the man that we may not have gotten to otherwise. And did you have a conversation with Alec prior to filming to let him know, look, um, we are we are fully intending to shoot a, a lot of this behind the scenes and have these conversations with you be a part of the film. Did you guys decide that early on with Alec? We did. We decided that early on and had that conversation with him. And, yeah. and um, I, I, I'm happy to say that he trusted us to, yeah. to do it. I don't... Yeah, yeah that he was convinced that it was going to work, but he let us, <laughs> he let us play, um, which is, a, a, I guess, a credit to his, I don't know, willingness to still go out on a limb. So let's, let's talk a little bit now about this idea that, you know, audiences are becoming more and more aware of, of the blurring of the lines of fiction and reality in documentary. And we as doc filmmakers, we we're constantly coming up with more inventive ways in which to employ different storytelling techniques. So I guess at this point, you guys seem like great people to ask, when is documentary film maybe no longer documentary? Is there a line that maybe we shouldn't, or maybe you can speak from your own selves that you decided, you know what, we're not going to cross this line. And if there is a line, what is that line? That, that's a great question, and I and I, I think it gets to the root uh, into one of the problems that I think film has in general, which is you know we and it's the same problem you know growing up listening to music is like we we love to categorize everything and and categorization <laughs> it, categorization I think is is good and it's important sometimes but it's also incredibly limiting you know like the I, yeah. the the word documentary in general still has a little bit of a stigma to it. That's it's right. Like, That's oh, right. am I going to learn something? This is going to be boring. It's going to be, I'm going to have to like sit and like actually be taught something. Like, Watch a bunch of talking shit. heads. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that like, to me, you know, it would be amazing if like, we didn't have to categorize everything so deep and we can just say like, hey, this is a really great film. You know, it happens to be a documentary. And, you know, it's kind of the problem that we're, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it's, it's the situation we're in right now where people are like, well, it's a documentary and a narrative hybrid. But really all it is is a film yeah. that is 
hopefully entertaining. And, you know, just like you go to see a Marvel movie, it has a beginning, middle and end, and hopefully it's satisfying and you get something out of it, you know? So like, I think at the, at the end of it, it's like, if, it, if we could just focus on great storytelling and not be so inhibited by like what box this gets put in, you know, I think ultimately um, that's, that would be progress for, you know, the future of filmmaking, mm. let alone documentary. Mm -hmm. Although I, I will say though, that I, I think you can cross a line and, you know, we, we were committed to telling as truthful a story as we could. Yeah. I think all documentaries have an editorial opinion. You yeah. know, there, I don't think there's one documentary out there that you can say is, is, you know, a hundred percent, can show both sides of an issue. You're going to have, because you're a filmmaker, you're a person, you're going to have an opinion, and that opinion is going to come through in your work. Um, you know, but, but unlike a Marvel movie, it's not, what we do is not totally fantasy. We don't make anything up. Every single thing that we did, especially in this film, was based on um, as, as close to the actual event as we could get yeah. based on, you know, the archival footage that we have. For example, you know, we took all the FBI, we have all the FBI footage. We had all of the undercover um, FBI audio tapes. And so we lifted, you know, exact dialogue, exact lines from that undercover stuff to, you know, put in the narrative. So, you know, we weren't, we weren't inventing things out of thin air. And in that sense, we were committed to telling a, a truthful story. Your story is still going to have an opinion, though, I think. But speaking within that, just to drill down a little bit more, I don't think a documentary's job is to be truthful. You know, it doesn't have to be. I think, uh, if, as Sheena was saying, it's like that's part of what you know – it, there is an auteur aspect to it of like, it's coming from a voice. It's coming from a person's point of view. It's coming from a desire to, to say something. And, you know, I think a film like American animals is a great example of that, which is, this is a great film, you know, and like, it's got documentary elements to it. And it also plays with a lot of the things that I think we were playing with too, which is this idea of memory and this idea of like, did that really happen? Or, it happened because that person said it did, but it, you know, this other person refutes that it happened that way. And they do a great job in that in American Animals doing that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we played with a little bit of that, too, because it's really about uh, how we remember people, how we know them. And John, as a, as a father, is very different than John the businessman, but they're people's uh, account of that person given their, you know, relationship to them is wildly different. You know, yet both are correct. But yet both are true. So, so maybe I'm not fully understanding this. Did you say that you don't believe a documentary has to be entirely truthful, or maybe I heard that wrong? Because I felt like no, I felt I, like I Sheena mean, was saying, "Look, there has to be an element. There has to be truth involved in this." Help me yeah. better understand, Dom, what you're presenting. Yeah, no, I was I was saying like the, that a documentary film isn't um, doesn't have to be held to the standard of like, you know, we shouldn't look at every doc as like, that's the real story. Or complete right? journalistic because, integrity or. Exactly. Because okay. I, I don't think that that's, I, I don't think a lot of documentaries come from that space. I think a lot of yeah. films and I'm not saying that we've made these films, but there are a lot of films that have an agenda. There's a lot of films that are trying to sway you one way, whether it's a leftist opinion or a right wing pers perspective. Of course. So, yeah. you know, there's, there's also, you know, I think that there's, there's a little bit of a danger in like lumping, you know, all documentaries together and saying like, oh, they're, you know, oh, that's the real story. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I get that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, using, using our film and John's story as an example, yeah. um, you know, what got us into this was talking about how, how can there be these wildly different versions of the same man mm. who was the real guy? Well, he was both hero and villain, you know? Yeah. He was a great dad and, and a brilliant engineer and a ruthless businessman. And I think, you know, not to put words in, in your mouth, Don, but what we've been trying to, to get to with, with this is, is that, you know, how do you really know what the truth is sometimes? Yeah. How can you, especially when you're dealing with, with people, and as he said, memory, you know, what is the real story? And, and it gets dangerous to, to, to be certain that you've got the 100% real version, you know, when someone else feels exactly the same way.
looking back now over a decade of documentary film work, what would you, and, and Sheena and Don, you both can separately answer this. What would you guys tell yourselves? What would you tell your first time documentary self today that, uh, that you wish you had known when you first started out, uh, working in documentary? He laughs. It's very hard for us to not be sarcastic because the easy <laughs> answer is, you know, choose a different line of work. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> it's hard not to be a smart ass with this stuff. Um, <laughs> we're, we're irreverent on the show often, but I get it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. I guess, geez, just stick with it. And, and eventually, you know, you'll be okay. I think the, the hardest thing to do is to not give up. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, actually, I don't know that I would say anything to my former self because I think just like life, you know, every everything that you've done leads you to the next thing that leads you to the next thing, and, and it's hard to go back and, you know, assess and say, oh, well, I really wish I knew what I was getting myself into because that's part of, I mean, as documentary filmmakers, that's part of the exploration of, you know, life right? You're, you're, you don't have all the answers. You're kind of getting through it. You, one thing leads you to the next thing. And I feel like the, the most important lesson that we've learned that we take with us to this day is, uh, the only thing that has really served us, which is to not, as Sheena said, to not give up and mm -hmm. to stick with it because you believe in it. And ultimately this business, the film business in general is really meant to, to break you. You know, there's so much, there's so much hardship and there's so much rejection and there's so much, you know, like it's just all uphill, uh, battles. So, you know, to, to get through it, but you know, you really have to continue to assess like, Hey, is this something that I believe in? Is this something that I am passionate enough to stick with, mm. you know? And, you know, maybe the answer is no. And that's a, and that's valid too. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah. to say like, you know, this isn't the business for me or, you know, I did it. I'm glad I did it but I don't want to do it again, you know, and that's valid too. So I think, um, you know, that's, that is the biggest thing that we continue to take with us, which is like, you know, success is, is born out of sticking with something that you believe in. One thing that I'll add that's more nuts and bolts is, you know, talk to other filmmakers. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to, you know, reach out to people whose films you admire, um, especially in the doc world. It's a really small community and chances are they'll talk to you and, and offer advice. And we certainly got great advice from a lot of people as we were kind of working our way, you know, up the ladder. Um, you know, get, get, a good, get a good lawyer, learn about fair use, um, learn about music licensing. You know, there's nuts and bolts stuff like that. But, but really just talking to people and getting their opinions and getting their advice can really help you along the way. Amen. I'm so glad that you said that. I mean, it is a big part of why we even started this show nearly three years ago. In the doc world, it can be a pretty solitary existence. And so a big part of the reason we put this program together is to try to help people become more connected and try to let, feel a little bit less lonely in this doc venture. So really, really happy that you brought that up. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. I mean, I think and, and what's also great is to hear from other people that uh, that literally have been through exactly what you've been through. And you're like, oh, wow, that, that is how it is. Like, it's not just me. It's a, that just didn't, didn't happen to me. I mean, talking to all of our peers, you know, we all it's like we all have been through the same war together, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Don and Sheena, what a lovely conversation. I'm so happy to have had you on the program. Uh, the film is Framing John DeLorean. Let us know how we can see the film. Uh, it is being released uh, by IFC Films on June 7th on, in New York City and on demand. And then uh, you can check uh, local theaters. It's being platformed out after that, uh, starting on the 14th in cities like Los Angeles and Philadelphia. And uh, I don't have the full list in front of me, but yeah, uh, yeah. if you can go to framingjohndelorean.com, I believe uh, all the screening info will be there. Again, Don, Sheena, thank you so much for being on the program. It's, it's been a delight today. Fantastic. Great. Thank you thank so you. much. Man. I really appreciate it. Don't forget, if you're interested in our free eight-part course, the Independent Doc Filmmaker's Essential Checklist course, go to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you in two weeks' time, Doc Lifer.
Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.